What's up, guys? This is Pedro from My Stuttering Life, where you will hear the good, the bad, the very ugly. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry. But through it all, just know that you are not alone. So let's get started. This is episode number 75. And my special guest is John McIntosh. John is 60 years old and is from Glasgow, Scotland, and has stammered for as long as he can remember. After graduating with an honors degree in English literature, John worked in social care for many years, mainly because he could not envision entering a profession that made big demands on his speech. At the age of 35, he was married with two young daughters and decided to become a high school English teacher, which he did until last August when he retired. In 2004, when he was 45, he completed the McGuire program course and was active in that program for many years. He currently is on the management committee of the Scottish Stammering Network, the main support group for people who stutter in Scotland, and has helped establish the podcast and, oh, and on that note, which aims to get stammering voices out there in the public domain. I am honored to have him as a guest with me on the My Stuttering Life podcast. Welcome, John McIntosh. Hi, Pedro. How are you doing? I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, sir. This is a true honor. I am. I can't wait to start this conversation. We have a, a lot of topics to cover, so let's get started. Right. I'm ready. Okay, so do you remember when you first began to stutter? Not the precise moment, but certainly I remember roughly what age I was. I was very young. I think I was somewhere around four years old. And I remember just you know having difficulty. I remember being taken to speech therapy in my hometown of Glasgow over here in Scotland. So that was... You know, that was very early. So, yeah, I think by the time I started what we call primary school and you'd call elementary school, I guess, and I think the stuttering was pretty much well ingrained in me by five years old, yeah. Does it run in your family? Are there any other family members who stutter? That's a very interesting question. If I'd been asked that question when I was growing up, I would probably would have said no, but with the benefit of hindsight, and I think with the benefit of experience, when I look back in my dear old dad, I now can see that he had a stammer. And and my father died in 1990. So recent, last year, I had the pleasure of meeting up with a cousin of his who's 86 years old and who we, we had never met, never really heard of. And one of the things I was keen to ask him was, when he grew up with my dad as a child, whether he'd whether he noticed any evidence of the stammer. And he said, oh, yes. And in fact, he remembers their grandmother calling my father uh, stuttery Bobby. So, but when I grew up with my father, it was never mentioned. He never acknowledged it with me. And he'd obviously developed some kind of care coping strategies that allowed him to usually to pass himself off as fluent, which was a shame. I think that's a missed opportunity. We, we could have had some good conversations about it, I think. Right. Oh, wow. Um, My mom st- stuttered as a, a um, child. And so in her um, teenage years, back then, you know, they had large families to w- work on the farm, you know, pick the cotton, pick mm-hmm. the onions, pick the watermelons. And so my mom, at the age of... I. Um, I believe it was 14, she was tired of her stutter. And she told herself, that's it. I'm stopping. I'm done. I'm okay. stopping. Wow. And she did. <laughs> and she did. I mean, the power of women, girl power. I mean, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, wow. And we have talks talking about difficulties that she had. And so I thank her for telling me the stories of when 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 growing up they would just tell her slow down oh yeah which is um if you tell me that it just gets worse so <laughs> well that's right and also the famous advice to breathe you know like we forgot how to breathe you know we know how to breathe i think that's 
Such advice is never particularly useful in my experience. <laughs> yes, sir, you are correct. Now, you were talking previously about speech therapy. How long have you had speech therapy in school, and did you find it helpful? Well, the first thing to say is I had no speech therapy in school. That's not something that tends to happen in the UK. It's, speech therapy is something separate from the educational institutions. So I, looking back on it, I had a little bit uh, when I was very young, probably around th four or five, and then again, maybe when I was nine, ten, but and then I, I later returned as an adult. So I've had various episodes of speech therapy. And I suppose the second half of your question, how effective did I find it? Not very, is the honest answer, is all I can say. Uh, I mean, people were very well-meaning, very kind, and really wanted me to improve. But my stutter wasn't particularly listening to them, I don't think. <laughs> one, of my, one of my memories I, ha I have of attending speech therapy as a child is of, of desperately wanting to please the therapist. It was a very nice lady. So when I went back for my weekly appointment then and she asked how it had been, and I always put as positive a spin on it as I could because I knew she'd be disappointed. But the reality was that any gains I made were pretty fleeting and it was hard to maintain them into the kind of non-clinical situation, if you like. So that's pretty much been my experience of speech therapy. So later on, when I was 45, then, then I got involved in a self-help program. And that that was a lot more helpful, actually. Talk about being in high school and and having a stutter. Because, you know, school is hard enough um, um, as it is. In grade school, I mean, kids were just cruel. But in but in in high school, how did you handle high school with having a stutter? When I was in high school, I think the the tactic I used was more or less the tactic I've used in every situation was to bury my head in the sand and pretend that it wasn't there. Uh, it was never openly, it seemed, seemingly never openly acknowledged by anyone. I think probably that similar experience to many people who stammer and stutter that they find it very, very difficult to talk about. Uh, and I certainly did. One of my memories of speech therapy, actually, is I remember just an indication of how I... Sh I think ashamed is probably not too strong a word I was of having a stammer. I remember walking back from the speech therapist and she'd given me some homework, some kind of exercises I should be doing at home. And I went into the house and I immediately went up to my bedroom and I hid them under the bed. And I told my mum and dad that there was nothing. So that that's an indication, I think, of the deep-rooted shame which I was feeling at such a young age. So my experiences at high school, of course, I guess were pretty standard. Uh, one of the memories I always have, I remember, I remember a French class, and we had a we had a student teacher from France taking the class, and I remember. She she asked me to read something out, and I just had a very long, silent block. <laughs> and as I was kind of bursting at the seams to try to force this out, one of the girls in the class had to raise her hand to say to the student teacher uh, that, that I couldn't do that, he couldn't do that. So, uh, which was so frustrating. We've all experienced these feelings. We've all experienced these moments. And it's very, very, very frustrating because it seems so situational. So certain situations, I could probably have read that sentence out with very little difficulty. But when the pressure's on and the light comes on and you have to go now, that's when you're going to block. And that's one of the most frustrating aspects of this condition, I think, is that when you need to speak and... Usually when you need to say something important to something important, that's 
that's when you're going to block. So that was a repeated experience through high school. One other experience I always remember, and I often speak about here when I'm speaking to groups over here in Scotland, is I remember one teacher, uh, they had me out in front of the class and I was to do a solo presentation and something. And I, I guess I must have been exhibiting a lot of secondary behaviours. So I'm moving around a bit up there and I'm probably jerking my head, moving my feet around, shuffling my feet around. And the teacher got a laugh out of the class by saying, John, we asked you to do a talk, not a dance. So the class all laughed, of course, and I felt pretty small, as you can imagine. So that was Miss Low. I've never forgotten that woman. <laughs> oh, John, I think we're twins because that happened to me in school. Her name is Mrs. Woolsey. Uh-huh. And this was in grade school where we had to read out loud. And so they would go down the desks. And then I was number five. I mean, it's vivid in my head because it was so traumatic. And so with each student reading their paragraph, my heart was just hurting. I mean, it I, it would, my hands were sweating. And with every st- student approaching, reading their paragraph, I mean, I couldn't even move. Because that's how paralyzing the the fear was. And so when it came to my time, that paragraph may as well have been a book. Because that first letter, I knew. I knew I couldn't do it. And the worst part is that we we had to stand up. And, and, and so I barely got up, you know, because my legs were all wobbly. And so I blocked... On that word, and then came a repetition of that letter, and I heard in in the background, "Oh, Porky Pig," mm. and then the whole class laughed, and the teacher laughed, the teacher laughed, and I couldn't do it. So I got back in my chair, and the kid behind me, to make matters worse, <laughs> had to read my paragraph that I couldn't read. So there was shame, there was guilt. I mean, there was, I mean, oh, and yeah. so from that day onward, I said, no more. This will never happen to Pedro again. And every time throughout my entire school year and in my undergraduate and in my graduate school, whenever we would have to read, I would just walk out and go to the restroom because I couldn't do it. Yeah, I guess. My my response was just to, was always to cross my fingers because you you never quite knew there's a there's a slight element of unpredictability. You, know, you might be having a good day and maybe you would get away with it. So that that was the knife edge which I walked for most of my life. I think and I think that's pretty t- typical of many people who stammer, and that's one of the worst aspects I think of the condition that. You just you never really know uh, what it's going to be doing to you. It seems to be a very fickle master of you. And one of the things which I think is important now is that, and something I try to bring into my life is that I kind of want to put myself more in control of that and actually think uh, what's going on inside me. What are the factors that are influencing whether I'm having a good day or a bad day? And trying to be a bit more in charge of that and more on the front foot rather than on the defensive all the time. Because like many stammerers, I lived a life of fear. You never knew when this thing was going to ambush you. So uh, that's not pleasant. That's not a nice background background noise to have going on in your head all the time. Oh, no. Fear. I mean, fear took over my life for 30 years, for three decades. Fear was in control. It told me what to do. It told me what not to do. It made me change my major in school from pre-law to psychology. I mean, fear. I mean, ooh, 
I mean, until I took back the power, until I took back control, fear, I mean, it ran everything 24-7. Yeah, absolutely. One of the sayings I've heard, which all always appealed to me, is that we have to move in the direction of our fear. So I think making progress and uh, dealing with a stammer does require a certain amount of courage. And one of the one of the issues I think that sometimes happens, maybe in speech therapy, certainly my experience of speech therapy is they they don't want to put you in situations where you might be frightened. So there's a certain amount of kind of wrapping you in cotton wool, I think, as a stammerer, and not exposing you to nasty feelings such as the fear. But my kind of understanding, I think, of this thing now is that you know, probably that's the only way you can really make any progress if you experience some fear and you learn that it's not going to kill you. See, and, and you know, you make a great point because um, I learned later in life when um, when I turned 40, that's when I told myself, that's it, I'm done. I will no longer care what people think about my stutter. I don't care if you laugh at me. I don't care if you make fun of me. That's on you because my motto is hurt people hurt people. So you have your own demons that you have to work through. I know that I'm awesome. And once I made that leap, I mean, everything lifted from me. The weight of the guilt, the weight of the shame, the weight of everything, it just lifted. And granted, I still stuttered, but the what I learned in facing my fear is that, oh, well, I stop, I breathe, I carry on. And so, I mean, but but you make an excellent point. You have to face the fear. I think that's absolutely right. And, and I think you're also dead right there when you talk about this feeling of guilt. That's one that has always interested me about this because that is certainly one of the feelings that is present, I think. We feel guilt, which always fascinated me because like, why are we feeling guilty? Is this our fault? Is this something we've done? And, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's unavoidable, but the idea that we're letting down our families, we're letting down ourselves, you know, letting down the folk who love us, They've got hopes for us. They have dreams for us. They want to see us doing well. And and often we're not achieving what they maybe want us to achieve and what we ourselves want to achieve. So we feel we're letting people down. And I think that's very interesting because, you know, folk who suffer from other... I'll, I'll choose my words very carefully here. Maybe other kind of issues... Uh, to, maybe don't experience guilt in the same way. So if you lose lose some sight and become visually impaired or you lose hearing or you lose mobility in some way, that the guilt we feel doesn't seem to affect them in the same way, I suspect. So I'm fascinated why we feel guilty about having a stammer. See, and again, guilt... Because, you know, growing up, um, I was always told that I was broken. I was told that I was damaged. And in my culture, in the Hispanic Latino culture, the males are in charge, Mm -hmm. um, culturally speaking. And so when I couldn't do that, I mean, I, I mean, I could see it in my dad's eyes, the disappointment. I mean which hurt more than anything else in the entire world because I couldn't do what my dad and my three other brothers could do. And 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 growing up hearing that I will never have a job, I will never get married, I will never have a career, all that I'm good for is to just st- stay home and collect d- 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 disability monthly. And that's what I was told for, gosh, for over 15 years. Yeah, 
That's an interesting insight into the sheer level level of the impact that this has on people's lives, I think. And I, I, sometimes I hear people who stammer playing it down a bit and saying, oh, it doesn't really worry me, it doesn't bother me at all, and I just get on with it. I think, well, I don't know whether there's a bit of wishful thinking there. And I think it might be more helpful if we said, Leah, you know what? This is a serious thing. This is actually pretty disabling in many ways. Now, there's a lot of things you can do to work on it. That's that's not being overly negative. You're simply recognising the reality. This is really, really impacting in people's lives. And all you have to do is to look at some of the discussions you see online from all over the world. Folk regularly posting on there about how they want to kill themselves. They, they feel just at the end of the rope. Uh, they feel they can't go on. Uh, they feel feel ostracised within their families, within society. And I think maybe we need to take it a, a bit more seriously. Uh, that all s- sounds very doom and gloom, but it's actually not. I think what you need to do is you need to accept the reality of what you're up against and then you can begin to deal with it. But s- simply turning your back on a problem and saying, this isn't actually real, I think that, that that's a pretense, I suspect. You are correct because, you know, I can't tell you how many posts that I read, you know, on Reddit um, or Facebook or on Instagram of uh, of people who stutter talking about you know, it's very dark. Nothing is g- going their way. And the only out is to leave this world. And so, I mean, I had to jump in and tell my story because when I was 14, I didn't have any, f- any friends, zero. No one wanted to hang out with a kid who stuttered, you know, who sputtered and would spit while they talk. And so in high school, we would have pep rallies um, Fridays. And so while everybody went to the pep rallies, I went home because no no one would sit next to me. Nobody would talk to me. And for years, I mean, for years, that that weighs on you until one day I told myself, that's it. I mean, this isn't a life that I want to be in because of my st- stutter and and so one night I grabbed my dad's gun uh, midnight and I walked out of the, of of the house and I walked down the road um, and was going to do it under the overpass and walking you know I can remember just crying profusely I mean just w- walking you know holding the gun in my right hand. And then as as I reached the underpass, there was this homeless man. And, you know, growing up, you know, we didn't have any homeless people in my area. We were a rural um, area. And so driving b- under that overpass every day, there were no homeless people there. Well, that one night, there was a homeless man. And and I walked up the um, in, the the um incline of of the of the um overpass and i was about to do it and the man asked me what was i doing and uh, you know i told him you know i'm done i'm done living because this isn't a life to live i don't you know i stutter i have no friends i mean everything is against me. I can't do anything. And then he told me, and I'll never forget this. He told me that we all have a purpose on earth. We're all here for a reason. We all have a gift. Go share your gift. Go share your gift. And I mean, I literally, the darkness, it went away. I turned around. I went back home. I put the gun back, woke up my dad you know, he whooped me <laughs> wow. and, and 
from that day on, it got a little better, but it got better because had he not been there, I would not be here today. That's an amazing story, Pedro, and thanks for sharing that with me. It's just a great example of how it's, it's almost a cliche about this idea that the darkest hour is just before the dawn, you know? So you were obviously right down there at the bottom and that. When you hit rock bottom, I think the only way is up from there, isn't it? But, but oh, yes, sir. Yes, that's sir. another example, I think, of how when we... When we keep running away from this data, and when I say running away, I guess I mean maybe telling ourselves that it's not real, acting it's not, it's not real, not talking about it, not acknowledging its existence, not acknowledging that it's part of us, then we give the thing so much power. The second we turn and look at it and say, right, I'm now going to actually look at you square in the face to see what I'm dealing with here, then you just start to put yourself more in a position of power and you take power away from the stammer and you realise that this is something which we do. It's not something that's exterior to us, that's our enemy. This is a pattern of learned behaviours, I think. And uh, we we can begin begin to make some changes. Now, we're not going to see like a cure overnight or you know, huge changes overnight, but we begin that journey. We take the first step in that journey, I think, and that's actually f- facing up to the reality of the fact that we are a person who stammers. In other words, we take on the identity as a person who stammers, I think. Yes, sir. You you are a thousand percent correct on that. And so I wanted to also dive into, do you have any advice for parents and teachers with regards to children who stutter? I would be slightly reluctant to offer to offer advice to parents of children. I'm not a trained speech therapist. I've never received any training in that. Uh, so you have to be careful, I think, with that. But What I would maybe offer some advice on is just to say to the young people themselves, you know, look, that this is not the end of the world. It's maybe not as bleak a situation as it maybe feels to you right now. And you you will have a good life. You will get out of this. And and I would maybe even go further. I would say, look, one of the things you should try to do is flip the stammer into something positive. This is a strength that the this is a strength that you have, and changing the way you look at it sometimes really lifts a darkness off you and lifts a load off your shoulders because we're so down on ourselves and everyone else is so down on us, as you referred to earlier on. You know, we feel so bad about ourselves. So just, yeah, maybe I would say to parents, build up the confidence of your kid. You know, let them know that they're fantastic. And this isn't something which is their fault. Uh, They don't deserve it. They're not doing anything wrong. And they can't simply stop stammering through a sheer effort of will. So that takes a kind of load off them. It's simply another condition among a million conditions that are out there. So they have something that is real. And once it's accepted and once you say, that's okay. This is something I'm dealing with. This is something I have. And, And then you can begin to use it almost as a strength. And certainly when I became, when at the age of 35, I became a high school teacher myself. That was something which I thought when I thought, let me work in the classroom in a certain way with kids. I think it gave me a kind of empathy and an understanding of what it feels like to be sitting in the class as an outsider and someone who was really 
very unhappy with the school experience. So you get an empathy with people, you become a good listener, I think. So I'm f- flipping the stammer on its head and thinking, this is maybe something which makes me a better person. I think that's a good thing to tell people. That's great advice, sir. Let's switch gears a little bit. Job-wise, did you ever experience discrimination because of your stutter? Most of the discrimination I think I've experienced in my life has been self-discrimination, self-sabotage. And I think that's something which is pretty typical of most people who stammer. It's not that you know you apply for jobs, you go for interviews, and you're discriminated against. You rule yourself out before the get-go. So certainly that's what I did. So when I graduated university with a degree in English literature, that was 1981. For the next 15 years, I worked in what I would describe as fairly basic grade of caring jobs. So you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but but f- f- for 15 years after I graduated with an honours degree in English literature, th- that's what I did. So scraping along at the bottom of the pile, if you like, hardly making any money, and life being a bit of a struggle. I was largely self-imposed. It wasn't that I had applied for jobs and wasn't getting them because of my stammer. What was happening was I wouldn't put myself in the situation where people could discriminate against me. Uh, The thought of an interview really terrified me. And so, as we mentioned earlier on, the fear was absolutely in charge and I didn't do anything. So my life was on kind of hold for 15 years, I would say. And then it was only in desperation. Uh, so when I was 35 years old that I applied to teach a training college, which was something I'd always wanted to do. And I was accepted and I did well and finally became a high school teacher. But by the time I did that, I was already married with two young daughters. So the sense of sort of lost potential and watching my life slipping through my fingers before me just became so overwhelming that it was enough to make me go to teacher training college, even though I was terrified at the prospect. See, and you make an excellent point Um, I can only speak for myself, but I am so guilty of of self-sabotage because in school, um, um, I was a whiz on computers. I loved everything, computers and keyboarding and whatnot. And so I would take jobs as data entry because there's no human interaction. Your, Your boss just gives you a stack of work to input into the computer, Uh, you know, you have eight hours and do it. And so there were so many awesome jobs that paid extremely well that I would never go for because with hearing all of that negative talk my entire life, it was ingrained in me. I can't do that. And so this is what I can do. And so, so I might did data entry, you know, for years and talking about the fear when the front desk person had to go to lunch or, you know, or take a break, they would call over the PAs. They need a person to come up and handle the phones. Well, once I heard that, I ran to the bathroom. I ran into a stall <laughs> and I would hang out there for 15 minutes if they were on a break or 30 minutes if they were on lunch. Because I said, no, 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 no. If if they called me to handle the phones, I mean, I am as sure as I'm... S- as, as I'm in this stall, they are going to fire me. So, oh, yeah, I, you know, oh, yes. Yeah, that that's an example, I guess, of how much we restrict ourselves in kind of invisible ways. And I always say that people who stammer are our own worst enemies, I think. And we tend to instinctively want to hide and we make ourselves invisible or... Maybe more accurately, we make ourselves inaudible. So there's no, very few 
people who stammer appear in the media. And usually the, the only narrative that's allowed in the media, the only narrative to do with stammering that's acceptable is the one where the person has made a miraculous recovery. The, the, that's, that's the story. Maybe you see occasionally on a talk show, you used to stutter, then you did something and now you don't. The, that's kind of an acceptable narrative. And it's one I suppose people love to hear that. Uh, that's a good news story, a few good story that will raise a few tears, but that's just not the lived experience of the vast majority of people who stammer. They, this is something they deal with sort of off and on, various levels of severity and bits of remission, I guess, but for most of their lives. So that's sort of the thinking behind the podcast that we do over here. We want to have an maybe with yourself as well, but we simply want to have stammering voices heard. That's my goal as well. I want to tell the world how awesome that we are, how courageous that we are, how creative, how re resourceful that, that, that we are. And I mean, we are out in the world, you know, we work in business, we work in medicine, we work with the law. I mean, we're all over the place and we are awesome. And so that's my goal of of this podcast, um, as well as what from what I'm hearing with yours also, is to just spread awareness. Yeah, that that's exactly right. So but the podcast we do over here, the, the idea is actually not to focus on stammering particularly, Though sometimes it will come up, but it's simply to have some people sitting around a table having a conversation, some of whom happen to stammer and some of whom don't. And that's it. Uh, so there's no kind of proselytizing, there's no preaching about stammering. It's simply we're people who stammer and you know we can be entertaining, we can be funny, we can be we can be something maybe you'll listen to for half an hour. So it's about that kind of normalising stammering and getting it out there onto the airwaves so folk maybe begin to develop a bit of understanding because one of the things I get frustrated with is that we we like to complain about the reactions of the members of the public but the, why would they know how to react? Because they never really encounter people with stammers. It's so rare. So we need to tell them. We need to let them know, this is what this thing is. This is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like. And this is how you should react. And it's not that big a deal. Right. And there are so many positives about doing a podcast. And so one of the positives is that I will get an email from across the globe of a person who has reached out, heard my my podcast or watched me on YouTube and told me that it is awesome that other people are out there because they thought they were the only one. I mean, I get those from all over the world. And I mean, it is I mean, it's just awesome how we have a platform to connect to anybody in the globe. That is incredible, actually, because I remember when we were both growing up, I mean, there was a real feeling of isolation, wasn't there? You felt there was no one to talk to. Nobody. Nobody. Literally, yeah. So now we have a whole world on our doorstep there, I guess, and there's all kinds of support groups online. National Stuttering Associations, etc. And there's a lot of support out there. And I think just fighting the sense of isolation is one of the best things which the internet can give us, I think. You know, what the most curious thing is, is that growing up, I thought I was the only person until I met another person who stuttered and he was 20 years old. I mean, I was in my 20s, he was in his 20s, and and that was the first time I had ever heard another person st st stutter. And how I know, 
I mean, ooh, I mean, it's so vivid, you know, in my head. Meeting him, he 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 wanted to greet me, but nothing would come out. And we were, um, I shook his hand and we kept holding the handshake because he was not able to, to get out his name. I wasn't able to say my name and I could look into his eyes, the pain, the agitation, the frustration. And finally it just came out. I know, I know. And I mean, and that was so powerful because I finally met another person like me. That, that's really, really interesting, Pedro, because I don't think throughout my whole childhood, my whole university career, I ever actually met one other person who stammered. So that that is strange because they reckon maybe one in a hundred person experiences stammering. So, you know, the odds are there must have been some of them around. But as I said earlier, we tend to hide ourselves away. So the reality was I lived in a house with another person who stammered and I didn't know it. So if he could successfully conceal it from me, uh, there must have been a load of people around me growing up, I suspect, who had a similar issue. But we feel so ashamed. We instinctively want to brush this thing under the carpet and hide it away. And that therein lies a lot of the problem, I think. Yes, sir, it does. Now, let's talk about um, everyday situations. How do you handle the telephone? Because for me, you know, for decades, it was my nemesis. Uh, how do you handle the telephone? Very rarely, probably. <laughs> no, that's not true. <laughs> like yourself, I mean, obviously the telephone is classically something which a person who stammers will be very, very wary of, I think. And I was no exception to that. Uh, you tended to settle into a routine where after I got married, then my wife would often make calls, would answer calls. And... Well, it was never explicitly acknowledged that I was avoiding answering the phone. Really, that's what was happening. So I would find find myself in the bathroom, you know, just if the phone rang, or I was engrossed in the TV, so I wasn't able to answer it. But these were all avoidance strategies, I think. So one of the things which I try to make myself do much more now is to use the telephone. And that that relates to what I was saying earlier on. You move in the direction of your fear. So when you find something you're afraid of, then the chances are that's the thing you need to do. So when I started working on my own speech, after I got involved in the Maguire program, then one of the things they expect of you on the program, they ask you to do in the program, is to use the phone a lot. So, so we talk about taking the taking it to the boring stage, just through sheer repetition and using the phone hundreds and hundreds of times. Eventually, the fear begins to tail off, and it actually becomes quite boring. And being in the boring stage is a great place to be. Oh, you hit it right on the head, John. You hit it right on the head because how how I handled the telephone is I bought one. I bought an uh, I bought an older office phone, and and so I would I would practice in my bedroom. You know, I have a background in theater. You know, drama. So I made believe that it rang, and so I would pick it up and practice my name. And then I would make believe that I was making a phone call. And so I did this for months and months and months until you, I mean, you hit it right on the head. It became boring. And so when it was time for real world application, I picked it up. I did it. Like you, I pra I mean, I practice. I mean, people thought I was crazy, but you know what? All of my coaches would tell me, if you want to get good at a skill, you need to practice. Yeah, that's right. Isn't there something about you have to 
you have to practice for something like 10,000 hours before you have mastery of something. So, so <laughs> We work 10 times harder than everybody else. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> you just start the simple things. Things everyone else takes for granted, we have to really work at, you know? Yes, sir. Now, how did you handle r- restaurants right now? You know, we're in this, uh, we're in a pandemic, COVID-19. But prior to that, how did you do in restaurants when you had to order? Well, as in other situations, I guess the the underlying strategy I used was one of avoidance. So my st- stammering was usually quite covert. It was usually reasonably well hidden because I devoted a lot of time and a lot of energy to hiding it. So usually I would choose something off the menu that I knew I could say. That that was the first the that was the first thought that was in my head. So often, often I would find myself eating something in a restaurant, you know, not because I particularly wanted it, but because the name of the dish was one I could actually get out. So that that's how I handled restaurants very often. And often, I suppose another aspect of being in restaurants was I would never complain. So if there was any kind of issue with the food at all, I was very reluctant to say anything to waiters or to management. That, that would have been a difficult situation and maybe you're nervous enough already and there's something to do with that relationship. But I just kind of, if I got into conflict in a restaurant situation, then that would make my stutter really bad, I thought. So usually I put up with whatever rubbish service I was given. (laughs) (laughs) John, we are twins because that happened to me so many times until the restaurant's they would upgrade and then put f- put pictures of the food on the menus. And so I just point. <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Shame, yeah. guilt. <laughs> we were in Venice last year on holiday and we did a, did a walking tour of the city with a young Italian girl guiding us. And she, she said that... Uh, she recommended some restaurants in the city and she said the golden rule is you should never go into a restaurant if they have pictures of the food outside. That's an indication that the food won't be very good. (laughs) (laughs) See, we live and we learn. We live and we learn. (laughs) Okay. And so do you feel that as people who... stutter do you feel that it's important for us to have a thick skin well yes and no i think being slightly like that slightly having a thick skin i think is useful because it avoids you getting too down and depressed when you're in different situations you know when you're maybe having a bad time of your speech and uh, but usually when we talk about having a th- thick skin, it's because, you know, maybe we're being insulted, maybe we've been mocked. And I have to say that since I left high school, that has practically never happened to me, i got to say. So my f- feeling about the reaction of members of the public to hearing a stammer is generally that nobody wants to be mean about it or very rarely does anyone actually want to be mean, they just actually don't know how to react. So sometimes they kind of laugh, but that's almost a nervous laugh because they don't know what else to do. They're not actually mocking you. So we often misinterpret, I think, people's reactions as being mocking us when actually they're not. They're only confused. And our perceptions, I think, if, which is something I was talking about the other night, which is 
one of the elements of John Harrison's stuttering hexagon, our perceptions are often wrong. We feel maybe someone's laughing at us. We feel they may be pitying us. We feel they may be getting impatient with us. And very often they're not. And the second that we are open and honest with people and we say to them, look, I'm dealing with a stammer here, uh, they kind of move on because they're really not that interested in our speech problems. They're not nearly as interested as we would like to think they are. That's a good point, sir. That That is a very good point. Now, do you find, because you are of the legal drinking age, uh, um, as as I am. Uh, did mm, yes, you, I am. I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> did you find that drinking helped with your stutter? <laughs> what are your thoughts, John? Well, drinking helped with most things back in the day, as I seem to recall. But, but um, bump. Interestingly enough, you've you catch me at a stage in my life where I'm 60 years old now and I haven't had a drink for six months actually and I just thought you know I, I took the decision that it wasn't really doing me doing me a great deal of good so while I like drinking while I like beer I love beer I'm not so sure it loved me quite so much <laughs> but I, yeah the effect I had in my speech was quite interesting because what I found was maybe after one or two, that would bring about an improvement in my speech. When I had any more than that, generally the effect was very, very negative. Wow. So that was my overall impression. So so I was often found myself caught in a bind where I wanted to... Maybe I'm at a party, I'm in a bar, and I want to have a drink... And I'm telling myself, that will help you relax and that sh- should help your speech. You know, that's the received wisdom, I suppose. If you relax, you'll speak better. But that, that often wasn't the case. And often, if I'd had a few drinks, then my speech was very much out of control. See, and I mean, again, I mean, um, okay, for me, my sweet spot was just two drinks. And that's it. If I had two rum and cokes, or you know, Jack and Coke, or you know, tequila, or whatnot, it two, and that was it. My speech was perfect. I mean, I was laughing, I was engaging, I was interactive, and people would tell me, Pedro, you should drink all day. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like no, 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 no. And the most interesting part is that. You know, at that point, I never thought about my stutter. I was just enjoying hanging out with my buddies. I was enjoying having a good time. And I never thought about my stutter. And I had perfect, quote unquote, perfect speech. And I mean, I thought that was like, wow. Yeah. Those are the moments that you... We really notice as people who stammer. We we get into that. Get, I heard it referred to as a flow state, where you just it's all flowing, and you're not even in control of this. But you're into a whole new state of being, and you don't stutter at all. And it's a strange thing to experience, a wonderful thing to experience. But you kind of know through experience that it's not going to last. And maybe when you come down from there again, it's a bit depressing. But that that is something I do recognise. You suddenly a thought suddenly the thought occurs to you. What well, I'm sitting in the bar here, I'm holding court with stories and people are listening to me and they seem to quite like it. And I'm not thinking about my speech at all, but the, those are the little kind of glimpses of the promised land that we're given. And but the they rarely last very long. And then you decide, oh, well, you know, this is because I had a beer. What I should do is have another beer and it will be even better. <laughs> but that's, that suddenly you realise, ah, that was a block. Now I realise that <laughs> little moment has passed and I'm back to the old me now. 
See, and you make a great point because I can correlate this to my acting. When I play a part on stage and that character does not stutter, I don't stutter. And I mean, it could be for an hour, it can be for 30 minutes, it can be for two hours. But if I am playing that part on stage, I don't stutter because that character in that play does not stutter. And the fascinating part is that when I'm done with that part, the moment I walk off that stage, I'm Pedro. And guess what happens? You start to stutter. Exactly. I mean, it's just, I mean... Gosh, it's a head scratcher. Yeah, I mean that—that's an experience which I've often heard. So, so I would have to say, you getting into dramas seems a bit counterintuitive. What went on there? <laughs> well, okay. So in high school, I had a really hard time, and so one of the school groups that had open arms to invite me in was the drama club. These were individuals who did not care that I had a stutter. These individuals were so much fun to hang around with, and they were positive. And they told me that I can do anything. I can do anything. And what what I had learned is, later in life, is that if you surround yourself with positive people, your whole mindset changes. And so in in high school there was a play the 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 w- 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 Wizard of Oz and so they asked me would I would I like to to play the lion I said sure no problem but let me tell you walking home I thought what have I done I am going to be the laughing stock I mean they're not going to want me ever again but I took the script Every single day for hours, I practice my lines and practice my lines. I mean, every day for a whole month, I practice my lines. And once I got on stage, I wasn't Pedro. I was the line. I got every line out. I did a little dancing jig. I mean, I was animated. It was awesome. And the funniest part was seeing the people in the audience with their mouths open because they knew that I stuttered. (laughs) so when you were in the middle of that experience on stage were you experiencing fear that you might stutter no i wasn't pedro no pedro always had the fear i was the lion a completely different character than pedro i mean i mean it's a head scratcher john i mean it's just i mean fascinating i mean the the idea of being in character i think is certainly one which i have heard a lot about uh, that will often mean the stutter doesn't appear. I mean, I've experienced some of that. I did a little bit of acting, I guess, when I was teaching. We would sometimes put on shows at the school, and I could do it, but it was always a bit of a tightrope. I always had a feeling I might fall off at any point, but I, I usually managed to get through it, but... Sometimes I would slightly change the script to make it a bit easier to say. But I guess being in a performance, I don't know, you get a kind of adrenaline rush as well, don't you, which certainly helps. And one of the things which I've really noticed is I play in a band. And when I'm front in the band, I'm the singer in the band and the front man in the band. And when I'm up there on stage and using that microphone, then I really don't stammer. Wow. And... Uh, it's strange. It's a strange thing. It must be something to do with a role. You find yourself in a certain role and the stuttering disappears largely. It but then does. again, I walk off stage and I bump into one of my buddies, as you say, and then I can't say a word to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, there's John. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> He's back. He's back. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. 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 And so you were just touching on this previously but when i'm talking and if i have a block you know back in the day i would tap my leg tap my face um, tap my foot my arms would go all over the place and my eyes would close and so it would help me get out 
the block. Had you ever used that rhythm method to help you get out of a block? Uh, I certainly did, yes. I think the, these are little secondary behaviors that I would probably now refer to as tricks. And we become very superstitious as stammers, I think. We think, well, if I tap this, if I do this, that will let me get the word out. What happens in practice is that we start to use these things because they worked once, but gradually what happens is the trick, the power of the trick wears off and it stops working. And we have to find a new one. So what we find is we eventually develop a whole range of these physical ticks and jerks and head movements and eye closing and all the rest of it uh, that we thought at one time helped us get words out. So they lose their power, they lose their efficacy, they don't actually help anymore with the stammering, but we still have the behaviours, we hang on to the behaviours. So, And often you know, that's associated with being in the middle of a block here. There's a lot of tension and physical struggle. And that's why Miss Lowe back in school told me I was doing a dance rather than speaking. And then also Mrs. Woolsey. <laughs> that's it, yeah. How so maybe I should have been a dance maybe I should have been a dancer. I may have been quite good, yeah. I should have been a singer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, what is the most effective technique that you do to help you with your fluency? Well, you know. One of the approaches I think I've used over the past probably 15 years is trying not to chase to chase the fluency god. So one of the things which underlies a lot of my approach nowadays, I think, is to, to try to be as open as I can about the stammer. So trying not to hide it. And one of the things which works particularly well, I think, in that regard is something called deliberate disfluency, or something that's called voluntary stammering, where you stammer on purpose when you don't need to. That that has an effect of kind of lowering the tension. You desensitize yourself to the sound of yourself stammering, uh, and you let the person you're speaking to, you kind of let them know what's going on straight away. So I think... That is something which is particularly useful. It's not always easy to do. It's actually challenging because it seems so ca counterintuitive. Uh, we want to avoid stammering. Why would you stammer on purpose? But this is something which has a long track record, actually, and goes all the way back to Joe Sheehan back in the 60s, I think, who first kind of documented it as a theory and an idea. And that's something which I've been encouraged to do. So I think that's among the most useful techniques that I use. But focusing on the content, focusing on your listener, that, that's really useful as well. And trying to avoid f focusing on the blocks. And you find the blocks start to fade away a little bit. A lot easier to get out of, I think. Oh, John, you are a million times percent correct. Because when I s started doing that, I noticed, I noticed that my speech got a little bit better when, when I was focusing on the person, focusing on the conversation. I was being in the moment, and by not focusing on my stutter. I stuttered less because I was more engulfed in in the other person and in our conversation. And so, I mean, you make a great point because I purposely do that every day. I'm in the moment. I'm focusing on living and not on my stutter. I think you know, that's what we all that's what we all want to achieve, don't we? We all want to just experience life and to enjoy our lives. That that's ultimately the goal. So maybe you know, maybe that's something we should focus on more than the idea of maybe a fluency which 
maybe unattainable to to most of us. And but what happens, I think, in reality is when you focus on the content and you focus on what's happening inside your head and you take care of that, then the fluency itself actually improves itself and you start to dissolve the stammer from the inside out. You are correct because it took me 40 years, four decades to do that. I mean, I had to completely, I mean, after being told every day for 20 years that you are dumb, that you are stupid, that you have a form of mental retardation, that no one will want to be around you. You tend to believe it, you know, but at 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 a certain point, it's like, no, uh-uh, no, I know I'm awesome. I know people care about me. I know people love me and I am awesome. So, but I mean, it, I mean, it took me 40 years. Yeah. So, just out of interest, Pedro, was there a teacher at your high school who you found maybe helpful or approachable or a person who you feel maybe helped to turn it around for you a little bit? Um, it was the the entire drama team and then our speech coach, Mrs. Pesic. She was the epitome of, of light. I mean, she... She was so encouraging, you know, Pedro, just get it out of your head. You can do this. I believe that you can do this. I can see you in my head doing this. And by having other people believe in you, which, I mean, I never had that, John, growing up. I never, ever had that. And once I heard that coming from a person that I didn't know from Adam, Mm -hmm. to hear that from her... It was just life altering because with with her telling me those words, that's when I knew I could do it. I could be on stage. I can act like everyone else here and do an awesome job. So you could acknowledge your stammer with Mrs. Pesic then have a conversation about it and admit to it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. See that that's really something I never had. There was no figure like that in my life as when I was younger. So most of my life, I practically spoke to no one about the fact I had a stammer. And I remember just having to flip that whole attitude on its head. Uh, as I said, when I got to f- f- forty-five years of age. I maybe had a conversation with my wife about stammering. Uh, I don't know, maybe maybe one or two others very briefly. So that's 45 years of silence. And then when I got involved in the self-help program that I got involved in, uh, they said, you have to talk to everyone about this now. So by the time I did that, I'd already been working in this school for nine years so they said I've finished the course on the Sunday and I was back to school first thing Monday morning they said right you got to go into school tomorrow morning and you you have to tell all the rest of the staff all the other teachers in the school and more importantly you have to tell all of your classes about what you've been doing so that was uh very, very frightening because that was exactly the opposite approach that I'd taken for 45 years. So I was a bit sleepless on that Sunday night. So I went into went into school on the Monday morning and I'd written a little note and so all of the staff had a, kind of a pigeonhole where you could stick little messages for them to get. So I... have photocopied this message explaining I had a stammer and I'd been in a speech therapy course and I now wanted to talk about the stammer so if anyone wanted to talk to me I would be very very grateful so I made copies and I gave every one of the staff one of these little notes and then I went into my first class and I thought wow this is with every fibre of my being 
this is something which I really, really don't want to do is to talk to these kids because you kind of think, maybe you're remembering your own experiences of high school, you're thinking, they will laugh. This is handing them an edge over me. And as a teacher, I guess you're aware of doing that. The reality of what happened when I did that, though, was one of the most life-changing experiences I've ever had. They they responded incredibly well. They they listened completely attentively, and they were incredibly supportive. And I mean, some of the kids in the class who maybe were the worst behaved kids in the class, uh, they were all very supportive, and that was such an eye opener for me because I thought, ah. This is the thing I've been afraid of in my whole life, and I've just done it. And actually, it's it's not got any power. It's not as bad as I thought it would go. In fact, it's good. It's a good feeling. So that has really been one of my overriding experiences probably in the past 15 years, where when you're open with people, when you tell them about what you're doing, and when you openly acknowledge that you have a difficulty in their life, they respond very, very, very positively and not in the way you might expect at all. So I was really, really moved by that and I thought, this is totally restoring my faith in human nature and it changes how you look at people and basically changes how you look at the world, I think, in general. Wow, that is powerful. I mean, to do that and and to have all of your preconceived notions just thrown out the window and to have them be open i mean that it ooh that that feels good over here in texas right now <laughs> yeah, well you know when you make yourself vulnerable people like that people respond to that and you know, most of us walk around at, I think with our defensive shields up the whole time, and and we like to maintain the kind of illusion that you know our lives are pretty damn perfect, really. And I think uh, uh, social media plays a big part in that here. Uh, we have to present our lives as something that's almost perfect, and actually acknowledging a weakness is such a liberating thing, both for yourself and for the people listening to you. So what happened is almost as soon as I did that, then immediately my relationships within the school all improved, all deepened. Something happened because I was being open and honest. And almost immediately, I had people in the school talking to me about what was going on in their lives, the issues they were facing, or the issues someone in their family was facing. So I thought, wow. And by the time I went home that Monday afternoon, I think my life had pretty much changed. Wow. I mean, that is just, oh, that's powerful. That's moving. It's powerful. Let me ask you this. Do you go through fluency phases for for an um, example, w- w- one week you are doing fantastic, and then for the next three weeks it's horrible, and then for the next month it's amazing. Do you go through those fluency phases? Uh, probably a little bit, but maybe not over as long a period as a week or a month. It's maybe it's almost day to day, and I, I, something I have noticed is that my stammer. It's, seems quite situational. So depending on the situation I'm in, depending who I'm speaking to, it will either be better or it will be worse. And I think, you know, there's been some research and writing up about that whole phenomenon. Uh, the idea of, sort of status gaps and if you, you know, speaking to someone in authority, sometimes my stammer might be worse than if I was speaking maybe to your kids in the class who I can feel more in control of. And if I'm in a situation almost where I'm in charge, where I'm at the mic, 
and everyone has to listen to me and I'm not going to be interrupted, that usually makes my speech better. So if I'm in a situation where I'm having to speak to large groups of people, that often my speech will be better in that situation and then I went to one conversation with someone. So I guess it's not so much phases of fluency and phases of disfluency. It's up and down every day, depending on who I'm speaking to and what I want to say to them. But now I can I know the triggers and I know the situations that will be difficult. Then I can, you know working strategies to make the speech better in those situations. Oh, how cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are times when I'll find myself in a stressful situation and, you know, I just have to talk to myself. Okay, just breathe. Just breathe. You know, it's an... It's a dude. He puts on his pants the same way you do. Just <laughs> breathe. You are going to do this. And then it's like a really bad block. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I feel you, John. Believe me, I do. <laughs> now, here, here is a hot topic. Okay. There are a, a couple more hot topics that we'll go over. But here's the first hot topic. So let me ask you, John. So do you let others finish your sentences well they they do it sometimes but not so much because i let them but it's more because it's it's hard to stop them sometimes and this is this relates back to what i was saying earlier about how people don't know how to respond they think they're being helpful they maybe want to be helpful and i know that that this is something which I know many people who stammer find very irritating, almost insulting. And I guess I do a little bit, you know, you know, when it happens. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, you think, right, you think you're being helpful. So you're coming from a good place, I think. But, uh, you know, maybe I would say to them, you know, maybe let me finish the sentence myself, even if I'm in the middle of a block. So... Uh, Usually I wouldn't want to let it happen, but I would recognize that, you know, as I say, they're not trying to be mean. They're only trying to be helpful, I think. Right. And do you feel like how I feel nine times out of 10, they'll, they'll get it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's especially frustrating. Yeah, we've all been in that situation, I think. Exactly. You know. Do you think that it would be appropriate for them to ask you, would it be okay if I, like, if you're having a block, do you mind if I help you? Do you think that would be appropriate? Uh, I think it would. It's, it's the, not a question I've ever thought of before, but sh sure, why not? I think, I think anything which acknowledges the existence of the elephant in the room is always helpful. So if it's, said uh, with good intentions and they're trying to be helpful. And I think you know, the fact they're asking the person who stammers, I think that's empowering the person who stammers. It's allowing them to make that decision. And I, I think that's respectful. So, yeah, I would have no problem with someone doing that. So how do you handle bad days? I know we have our good days and then we have our bad days because of our speech. How do you handle having a bad day? <laughs> That's a hard one. I guess if the bad day is, you know, bad day speech-wise, they get interconnected, I suppose, and so many things go on in your life at the same time. Sometimes it's hard to separate out uh, whether it's the speech that's having a bad day or whether it's someone else that's having a bad day. And they all kind of affect each other, all these aspects of your life. So I guess I, mean, I have a... Range of techniques, I guess, that, that I can draw upon. So I guess if I feel my any natural fluency I may have is running low, then I, I, I guess I will use more of the techniques to maybe get me through difficult situations. So using a breathing technique, using more 
deliberate disfluency, or doing a little doing a lot of work in my thinking and thinking, well, you know, what is the cause of this? What's actually happening? And you know, one of the things I find most helpful, I, I think, is the idea of the stuttering hexagon. I don't know if you've come across that idea from John Harrison, where things like your emotions, your perceptions, your beliefs. They all f- f- feed into your speech and to your level of fluency or otherwise. So you do a kind of you give yourself a little health check, a mental health check, a little personal audit. You know where are my feelings? What's going on in this situation? And often that's quite helpful. And if you address those things, then the speech takes care of itself very often. That is great. I've never heard of him. Could you um, email that to me? Because, you know, I'm still learning. I'm 49 years old. I'm still learning. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's John Harrison is the guy's, guy's name. I'm actually looking at his book just now. Uh, John was from New York, I think, and he moved out to California, I think, in the 60s. And he became one of the founders of the National Stuttering Association of America. Oh, cool. Okay. So I'll go check he, him out. So he worked for those. And he developed a kind of model of looking at stuttering that he called the stuttering hexagon. Hexagon, okay. So because there are six aspects he thinks are involved. And the central focus, I think, is if you simply focus on the speech, then any gains you make won't be very long-lasting. And that's seems to be an accurate representation of many people's experiences of speech therapy. So they focus on improving their speech and improving their fluency, and that looks as though it's going to hold up, and it holds up in the clinical situation. But but when you're back in the real world, facing the same issues that you did before, the, the other parts of the hexagon start to drag the speech back down again. So it's a sort of analysis of the thing, which I find pretty convincing, I have to say. How cool. I will definitely check that out because, you know, my motto is never stop learning. You know, just keep on learning as much as you can because readers are leaders is how I grew up. So here, here is a head scratcher, John. So when you are alone, can you speak without stuttering? Well, actually, no. I, not all the time. I can't, actually. I can find myself in a situation where, where I'll run a little experiment and I'll think, OK, let's record myself. I've got no audience to criticise me or judge me or anything. And sometimes the stammering behaviour is still there. The, then there are other times when I do the experiment and the stammering behaviour isn't there. So, you know, that interests me because I sort of incline to the idea that, you know, this is an issue to do with social communication, communicating with other people, so which would suggest that if you were on your own, there's no social communication involved, you wouldn't actually stammer in that situation. But actually, I do. See, and like you, that's what what I do um, as well. When I am alone, you know, when I wake up, I talk to myself, as we all do, you know. And so as I respond, you know, I'm still s- stuttering when I'm talking to my dog, Ruby Jean. I'm still stuttering. So, you know, wh- when I ask people who stutter from around the world, it's just split 50-50 right down the middle. Yeah, that, that's about right. One of my friends over here who stammers, we, we had that conversation and he said that you know, not only does he stammer when he's alone, he actually stammers in his dreams. Oh, wow. So he has a dream. <laughs> that's interesting because I've never done that. Uh, wow. I'm not sure I have either, actually. Wow. <laughs> now, now, do you find that your stutter is worse when you're tired or when you're stressed or both? 
certainly when I'm tired, it gets worse. That that is something I've definitely noticed. So, and again, we all analyse these things and we ask ourselves, you know, what is going on? You know, what, what is the speech mechanism that is affected by tiredness? And I guess something must be going on in the brain at that point. Uh, but that's definitely the case. As I become more tired over the course of the day, generally, generally I will experience more disfluency. Uh, stress is an interesting one. Sometimes it has a negative effect and sometimes it has a positive effect. And I think... It's, but stress is stress isn't necessarily a bad thing. Stress is something we actually all need. Stress is the thing which leads you to get things done. So you make demands on yourself of some kind. That's a form of stress. Where it becomes a problem is when the level of demand is out with what you're capable of actually actually achieving so you can argue for instance that you know me being on stage with the band you've been on stage acting that's stress but it has a positive effect so I think stress is a bit of a blunt instrument to kind of describe a range of different things I think some of which can have a positive effect and others of which can have a negative effect see and that is fascinating because I feel the exact s- 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 same way and and so I mean you had you had touched on this previously but um working all day long talking to people and doing the phones and conferences and conference calls and everything do you find yourself at the end of the day completely drained? exhausted mentally physically i mean do you find that happens to you well not so much anymore i have to say because i've retired now but (laughs) when i worked as a high school teacher certainly i mean that's a draining job anyway that's an exhausting job and that makes a lot of demands on the teacher there's a very heavy workload associated with it, at least over here in the UK, I think. Uh, so, yeah, by the time the evening would come around, generally I'm a bit of a, a spent shell of a man. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I I just hop on the couch. I don't want to talk to nobody. I don't want to see nobody. The lights are off, and I just want to just be in the silence. Yeah, but that, that's something I certainly recognise, and that, that that is something which even now I think you kind of know when you've had enough, maybe socialising, meeting up with other people, and you just want some space. And I don't know whether that is a thing with you know, maybe it's an introvert, sort of extrovert thing that's going on there, but. You see, if you've got an introverted personality, you have to have time on your own. And that's how you recharge your batteries. Where if you're an extroverted personality, the, the way you recharge your batteries is b- by being with other people. But that is certainly not me. And if I've had a lot of conversations over the course of the day and a lot of interaction with people over the course of the day, then I often want to have some time on my own. Which is a little bit awkward sometimes when you're married. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast episode, John. <laughs> Let's move on, John. <laughs> okay. So has this ever happened to you? So let's say you have a doctor's appointment. And so you walk into the office and there's a front admin person there and they greet you and they ask you for your name, and then you have a block, like a really long block. And then they ask you, did you forget your name? Has that ever happened to you? Uh, yes, it has. Yep. No, 
Not for a little while now, I have to say. But I think that's a standard experience for people who start out. This is something which I seem to be saying quite a lot, is that we we share these experiences, people who start out all over the world, I think. Uh, these things seem to happen to all of us. And what's astonishing is that we we would rather almost the, the, let the person think that we'd forgotten their own name to, than admit that we have a stammer. So we, we should say to that person, what, seriously? Do you think I've actually forgotten my own name? Is that a serious question? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly I haven't. So I'm dealing with a stammer. I'm dealing with a stuttering problem. And I, that's, I guess, how we should deal with it. And that's just being honest and open. But so often we don't do that. We We would rather leave that person with the impression that, yes... I am the person who forgets their own name. That's how I'd like you to think of me. <laughs> and see, John, you make a very awesome point. Be open and honest and just educate. Because yeah, yeah. that way, for the next person that has a stutter, they are more better equipped to handle it. Because I can tell you, if I had a quarter for every time that happened to me, I'd have 10 Range Rovers in my driveway. <laughs> 10. Yeah. Okay, so here is another hot topic. So, you know, Dayton is hard for everybody. But if you stutter, if you have a stammer, it's like a million times more difficult. How did you handle dating with having a stammer? Well, much the same way I handled everything else, I suppose I worked incredibly hard to avoid giving the impression that I had a stuttering problem. Looking back now, knowing what I know now, that was such a missed opportunity. What I sh should have been doing at the time was, was working that stutter for all it was worth. That, that, would, have, that would have brought me more success with women, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, for the reason I mentioned earlier on, when you're open with people and honest, when you make yourself vulnerable, that that's an appealing quality. And I think it's maybe especially appealing to women. You are correct. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong to say that. So No, no, that, no, no. That, so that was a weapon up my sleeve that I didn't know I had back in the day. So then I got married, of course. So now it's not an issue for me any longer, obviously. But uh, you know, <laughs> back in the day, you know, that was that our was power. Something I could have exploited more ruthlessly, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so what do you think about all this new technology? We have Google Home, we have Alexa, and then we have. Siri, do you think that all this new technology is helpful or hurtful for people who stutter? Well, by new technology, if you mean voice-activated technology, yes, sir. I guess you know that's going to be a challenge. We like to, you know, generally like to write things down. Maybe we like to text people rather than call them or message them in some way. So I guess, I guess anything which makes increased demands on our speech, we may find quite challenging. But you know, my underlying approach, my underlying philosophy is that being challenged is a good thing. So, so while on the surface it, it will s s certainly present people with some difficulties, I imagine uh, when they start to address the stammer and maybe. It's, be more on the front foot with a stammer. You know, maybe it's an opportunity to practice their speech more often. So it's a bit of a mixed blessing, I think. See, and for for many people that that I speak to from around the world who st who stutter, they share your response in that 
it gives them an opportunity to practice because it's not a human being. It is a machine, and that helps them to practice their speech. That's interesting, isn't it? Because we we don't have one in this. I don't have one of those things in this house, I have to say. But during the lockdown over here in the UK for the pandemic, I was in a house where there was... There was one of those devices, a Google thing. So you could operate all the all the music and the radios and things in the house if you prefaced your words with, hey, Google. So luckily enough, those were words I didn't have a lot of difficulty with. So that was something I was able to do. But something I was struck by was just how even though in your head, you kind of know it's a machine or an algorithm that you're talking to. She sounds very, very like a grown woman. So it's almost kind of the same feelings, you know? She sounds pretty real, doesn't she? Yes, she does. <laughs> and my main issue with all this new technology is why does it have to begin with a letter that I have great difficulty with? And so like you... Um, I use a bumper word. You know, I'll say, hey, Google, or hey, Alexa. Now, that S1, oh, my gosh. Thank God I'm Android. Um, and so I'm not Apple. But that S, it is like a tire going flat. I can never <laughs> get that S out. And so, like you, I use b- b- bumper words. And 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 so, for me, it has proven um, a great help. Yeah, when I was saying, hey, Google, I actually wasn't t- trying to use a bumper word. I was just told, <laughs> you know, that's what you say. You say, hey, Google. <laughs> so that's what I did. So I don't know. Now, speech-wise, what is a challenge that you had to overcome and how did you do it? Gosh, that's a hard one. I mean, there are a number of challenges over the years, I guess. Uh, s- speaking in public it was never something I thought I would ever be able to do, really. And as I said, speaking openly about my stammer in public was, was something I thought I'd never be able to do. But that, that that is something I've done quite a lot of now. And it's been great fun. I've really, really enjoyed being able to do that. And what, what I've learned over the years is that when I tell my story, generally people seem to like it they seem to find that kind of gripping, kind of cact- captivating. Uh, so that was certainly a challenge. And I guess, as I mentioned earlier on, when I undertook the Maguire programme in my mid-40s, there's a real emphasis on that programme on overcoming challenges and going into fear situations, in fact, actively seeking out fear situations to challenge yourself. So one of the things I did when I went back to school, as I talked about a bit earlier on, I actually asked the principal of the school, the head teacher of the school, uh, if I could address a whole school assembly. So there was something like 400 kids in the assembly, which it wasn't the whole school, but it was all of a certain year group. And it was just to talk to them about my experiences of having a stammer and I suppose the effect it had on me as a person and as a teacher. That that was something which never in my wildest dreams could I imagine ever been able to do. And it went really, really well. They, they, they listened really, really, really attentively. Uh, they seemed very, very interested. And I guess, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, they responded very, very, very positively to the fact that this was a teacher who was being open about a difficulty that he had and not presenting himself as the fount of all knowledge anymore. So I guess that was certainly a challenging situation. Uh, I'm trying to think of other things I've managed through over the years. Uh, most of the challenges I had, I guess, in my younger days, you know, being interviewed for jobs and doing presentations at university and stuff, I 
kind of managed to muddle through, I suppose, largely through avoiding words and using various tricks. But in recent years, I guess in the last 15 years, I've attempted to be more more honest with people and to f- face challenges a, a little bit more head on. So the, the watchword I think here is honesty. You need to be honest with your audience. If you try to pull the wool over their eyes, they really don't like it. But if you're honest, they kind of respect that. Wow. You are so, so right. Because what, what I learned later in life is is now I tell everybody, I disclose, I tell everyone that I have a stutter and that they might see that my eyes close and that my arms are going all over the place. They may hear me blocking or repeating. That way they know what, you know, what is about or what may happen. That way they could possibly, quote unquote, help me (laughs) and finish my sentence. (laughs) All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I used to do something similar at the start of every school year with new classes. I would meet the class and I would say, well, listen, this is something you're going to notice. So I was an English teacher, so I had to do a lot of, do a lot of reading in class. And I, I said, I just said up front, uh, something you should know about me right from the start here is I'm dealing with a stammering problem. And uh, you will notice me doing things in class and I may have long pauses. I, you may hear me breathing and it doesn't mean that I'm having a heart attack. So you don't have to call anyone when it happens. And <laughs> that happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go right? <laughs> so one of the things I also used to say to the classes is, uh, that after I disclosed that I had a stammer, I said, now, you, you will no doubt be wanting to give me a nickname. So I said, so sh- sh- show some creativity with the nicknames and that'll be fine. But, you know, don't go for any of the obvious ones. <laughs> so that, that, that... How cool. Doing something like that, you put yourself in charge and you you take back power. Right. So what you're saying is that you can't hurt me. If you want to call me names and you want to laugh or whatever, which they never did, by the way, uh, that's cool. That's okay. And once they realise you've already been honest with the class, you've already disclosed the whole, it's all out there on the table, and you're not trying to hide anything, they have no more power over you at that stage. They only have the power just as long as they think you're trying to hide something from them. Because if you're trying to hide it, then you're sending them the message that this is something you're ashamed of, and they can see that. So if you're ashamed of this, then they can use that against you if you want. Once you give them, once you send the message to them that this is something which you're cool with, then they lose interest almost in having a laugh about it. Wow. I mean, you hit such a strong chord. You are extremely, a million percent correct. Be open, be honest, be vulnerable, and take back the power. Take it back. That's it. Now, what has stuttering taught you? It's taught me that that everyone, no matter who they are, has something going on under the surface. It's something which, even if they look like they have a, like they have the perfect life, that they they will have something going on in the background that that they're struggling with, and just at the risk again of repeating myself that being open about these things and admitting to weakness and vulnerability is very is a very powerful thing to do and i think i think in a nutshell that that's the main thing i've learned from my experiences as a stammerer and 
when you do that, as I said earlier on, you kind of realise that the way people react to you is very, very positive usually. That was such an eye-opener to me because I some from somewhere I'd internalised this belief that people would would react negatively. But that was such a revelation. I can't stress, stress how large an experience that was for me when you realised that actually, no, you, you, know, you put yourself out there and they will catch you. So that's what it's taught me. Wow. And this will parlay into the next one as to what advice would you give to another person who stutters? I would say to I would say to them to, to ask themselves the question: What do you want? What do you What do you want to happen? What do you want to happen in your life? What will make you happy? What do you really, really want? And I think when you ask yourself that question, I think that's often the beginning of the journey. And you begin to pick apart uh, what you actually want to happen. Because I think often we have what Joe Sheehan used to call the giant and chains complex, where we blame it where we blame everything on our stutter and we tell ourselves that if only we didn't have the stutter, you know, we could have been somebody. We could have achieved so much more. So I was a giant in chains. But uh, that's often not the case. So I would say to someone else, just sort out in your own head, what do you want? Ask yourself that question and really, really think about it hard. What would you like to see happening in your life? And then when you've identified that, um, then we can begin to look at ways you can make it happen. Wow. That is awesome and powerful, John. Oof. I got chills. Hold on. Oh, that was good. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I know you're in an awesome podcast, but let me ask you this. So, so if you didn't have a podcast, so if you had an opportunity to to give insight about st stammering to the world on a world stage, what message would you convey? I would want to tell people that this is a real condition. This is something which has which can have a very adverse effect on people's quality of life. So be respectful to people who stammer, right? So this is something uh, which has a very adverse effect in people's lives. So be respectful. This is not a joke. This is not a comedy routine. And uh, just in the same way as you wouldn't be mocking a person in a wheelchair or a blind person, why would you mock a person who has a speech difficulty? So I think that's something that's important. But I'd also want to strike a balance that says this is something which you can really work on and you can make a lot of changes, either in the speech itself or in how you feel about your speech. I guess that's if your audience is people who stammer. So you want to say to people, this is something you shouldn't beat yourself up about. This is not your fault. It's not something you did. You're doing nothing wrong. But you can make some changes and there is a real way forward to a more positive outcome. So it's a message of hope to people who stammer. I think that you, know, you got this, and you can, you can, you can give yourself the life maybe that you would like to have. How cool! That is an awesome m message, John. And so I would like to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for hopping on this podcast. Thank you for sh sharing your story because I believe there's healing in sh sharing. You are hashtag awesome, courageous, and phenomenal, just FYI. And so I have awesome global l l listeners. Let's say they wanted to reach out to you. How would they do that? Well, we're on a podcast here. And it's in, in Scotland, 
which is part of the UK, and it's run in association with a group called the Scottish Stammering Network. So we have a website, which is at stammeringscotland.org. We also have a presence on Facebook. So that's the podcast itself. So the title of the podcast is is O and On That Note. So that's O and On That Note. That's all one word, lowercase. And that is indeed our email address as well, is O and On That Note at gmail.com. So we would love to have any of your listeners hopping across and having a listen to our own podcast. That would be fantastic. And any observations anyone has, they can go onto the Facebook page, leave a comment on there. We would love to hear your thoughts and your comments. And of course, you can email us at the address I just gave. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to reach out to all your listeners across the world, Pedro. Thank you, John. This has been an awesome conversation. I mean, whoo, I took a lot of notes because you were dropping some golden nuggets, let me tell you. I was writing down a lot of stuff. And so I'm I'm hoping this will not be our last conversation down the road. Let's talk about other big topics that that affect people who stutter because the more you know, the better that we get. Yeah. yeah well, I would love to do that, Pedro. So I'm usually available. So. <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you so much. I hope you have an awesome day. Take care and be well and stay safe. Th- th- thanks again for having me, Pedro. All the best. Thank you, sir. If you like this podcast, head on over to Apple Podcasts. Subscribe, rate, and review. Thank you for listening. And we will talk again.